Hello. <laughs> um, it, it, I don't know if you guys remember yesterday when I was doing like a test run for this, I said I'm not all that tech savvy. And that's really true. I couldn't get my, my laptop to work for this. But it looks like a few of you are showing up. So here we are. Um, yeah. So good. Uh, we're going to give it a few more minutes since, uh, you know, Sunday morning and technology. So while we're uh, getting started, I want everybody, I want you to imagine a prelude, a lovely prelude that you really like is playing right now. <laughs> whatever format you like okay all right so let's go ahead and and get started and um, I'm sure people will continue uh, joining us as as we go so again I apologize for for this I'm gonna have to get in an actual millennial to show me how to do this right sometime next week all right here we go Good morning and welcome to virtual Birmingham Unitarian Church. <laughs> I am the Reverend Mandy Beal, this congregation's senior minister. This is uh, our very first attempt at a live stream Facebook worship service as might be readily apparent. Uh, today it's gonna be just me, uh, but we're exploring options to include our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, as well as a worship associate in the future. It should be well noted though, that although I am our youngest staff member, I am also our least tech savvy. So your patience and your prayers are deeply appreciated during this hours. If something, you know, if I get cut off, I'm just gonna curl up in a ball and cry. So I <laughs> encourage you to just take it over for me, okay? Um, Birmingham Unitarian Church is a welcoming congregation. This is a designation that a congregation can get from the Unitarian Universalist Association that demonstrates a commitment to learning about and doing work of being fully inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and families. We're also a Green Sanctuary congregation, which is a similar designation for environmental justice concerns. And although there is no such designation for racial justice matters, we are deeply committed to that work as well. Our services are typically on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. and they usually take place in a building, in a sanctuary even. It is also not usually just me, which I think we can all agree is for the best. If there are any of you who are joining us for the first time today in our online format, I'd like to extend a special welcome to you. This is normally where I would encourage you to stay for coffee hour and I'm not really sure what the online version of that is, but I think it's maybe stay around and make some comments after the service and maybe make some virtual friends. We hope that you will come and check us out in person once we're back in our regular space on Woodward Avenue. For announcements today, I want to encourage everyone who is watching to reach out to your friends in the congregation that don't like to use technology. Give them a call, make sure they're okay. Also consider adding them to the ongoing list of people that we're making that would like check-in calls, as long as you're sure they actually want check-in calls. Now, secondly, during our shutdown, I am temporarily suspending my practices about manuscripts and I will allow my work to be distributed. We'll send them out by email weekly. We'll also send them by mail to people that don't know how to use email. But if you have anyone that you'd like to add to that list, please let us know as well. So today's service is obviously going to be very different without any music. It is going to be word heavy. We will follow a shortened version of our typical format. And after that, there will be a time for questions with the minister. Uh, so this is basically a sermon talk back and I'd like to hear your questions about the reflection and other theological matters. But I ask that we stay away from the administrative and technical things because this is a worship format. So we'll have another time to do that later. Uh, perhaps fireside chats, quite literally, by my fireplace. So with that, our service will begin. Today, uh, for our chalice, 
we'll be using a devotional candle. And I know that that can make some people feel a bit anxious, but I want to make it clear that this is a devotional candle to Joan of Arc. And it is uh, for all people whose voice has been silenced by organized religion. As we worship this morning from our separate homes, we join with the multitude of Unitarian Universalists in lighting this chalice. Spirit of our lives, move through and among us. In our time of uncertainty, be our rock of ages. In our time of fear, be the eternal one, the ruler of the cosmos, who has kept us alive and brought us to this moment. In our time of hoping for single, simple answers, be the one of 99 names, the merciful, the compassionate, the guide. In our time of doubt, be that which cannot be named. In our time of overwrought emotions, be the steady hand of reason and science. May our chalice flame be a beacon of hope and comfort in a world turned upside down. Our opening words this morning come from Gretchen Haley. It's called Forged in the Fire of Coming Together. What's gonna happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails as if the new Zodiac, capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promises of making sense or turning out the way we thought, as if we were not also actors in this unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from needing to know, the yearning to have it already figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have all of the control or none of it. Here in our words and our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make space for a new breath a new healing, a new possibility to take root, that is courage. Forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible, that we are creating it already here and now. Come. Let us worship together. We're going to move into a time of spiritual centering now. I'm going to, this is going to stay lit. I'm just going to, yeah. Today we're going to focus on our breathing. Uh, in a time of anxiety, our breathing often becomes short. And learning how to lengthen that breathing is a very powerful tool for calming down anxiety and relieving the stress on the parasympathetic nervous system. So in order to get us started, I'm gonna ask that you take your hands and you place one hand on your chest, it doesn't matter which one, and the other hand on your belly. Bring your shoulders back, tuck them behind you as if they were angel wings. I invite you to close your eyes as you're comfortable. We're gonna start by just noticing the breath. It's tempting to start to change it immediately, but before you do that, you need to figure out what it is you need to change. So feel your breath. Is it ragged? Is it withheld? Is it thin? Just take a second to be with that. If we're going to move through an emotional space, we need to begin by honoring what our emotions are. 
All emotions serve a purpose. The question is, is this the right time for that emotion? And how much of it do you really need? We begin to move the breath down into the belly. So the reason we have our hands on our body like this is to see if we're breathing first into our belly. Also, take a second to acknowledge what the rest of your body is doing. If your feet are shifting around, ground them down. If your eyes are blinking and twitching, ask them to relax. So breathe in deeply to your belly. Exhale completely. Imagine that your belly is a big balloon that you're filling up with air. And then as you exhale, draw your navel into your spine. Let's do that again. So what we're hoping for is a reduction of the movement of the chest. If we're breathing deep into our belly, the chest stays pretty still. It's common for the chest to move a lot, but we want to create a change here so we can change how we feel. Don't spend any time on shame or frustration if that's not how your breath is. Just continue to try to relax those stomach muscles so the breath can go in there. Now we're gonna to try to count. We'll breathe in through four, four, just count to four, however fast you count it. And then exhale for four, two. Let's do that three more times. Inhale four. Exhale four. Inhale four. Exhale to four. And one more time. We're going to change two aspects here. Now as you exhale, I invite you to purse your lips together like you were blowing out through a straw. And this time as we inhale, we'll keep the count at four, but we'll exhale to the count of six. So breathe in four, and exhale six. And do that three more times. Inhale four, exhale six. Release any tension in your facial muscles. And inhale four, Exhale, six. And one more time. Now take this opportunity to notice any changes in your body. How is your natural breathing? Are your muscles more relaxed? What are your toes doing? May the space and the peace that we've created in this practice stay with us through the rest of this hour and indeed carry us through the rest of this day. Amen. Our reading this morning comes to us from Peter Jackson's version of The Lord of the Rings. Oh, actually from the movie The Return of the King, which is the last in the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. So this is not found in the books. This is in the script. This is Sam talking to Frodo towards the end of what was a long and brutal journey. I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? 
How could the world go back to the way that it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I think I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. And Frodo says, what were they holding on to, Sam? That there is some good in this world, Mr. Frodo. That is worth fighting for. So here we are, friends. We're having church online due to a global pandemic. I don't think that any of us expected to be in this situation. But here we are, doing our best to cope with it and trying church in a radically different, brand new way. And it can be deeply uncomfortable to do things for the first time. But I'm proud of us for giving it a shot. I'm proud of you for showing up anyway. Having church on a Facebook live stream is kind of exciting, although I'm not used to seeing my own face this much, but it is a little exciting because it feels like we are the church of the future. We are so lucky to live in a time when we are able to connect remotely, to still be a part of each other's lives, even if we can't physically be together. It's kind of fun to try new things, to be creative, fitting the traditional parts of a worship service into a radically new format is sort of like a puzzle. But also, I kind of hate puzzles, especially those giant jigsaw puzzles. I find that if I focus on all of the little pieces, I get frustrated about how nothing fits. And if I think about the big picture, I become overwhelmed and I wanna quit. I like a challenge in life, but some puzzles are just ridiculous. Like, come on, man, really? <clears throat> Don't worry about that. That's left over from a cold a few weeks ago, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> So doing things in mostly the same way is comforting. Humans are creatures of habit and we like a predictable schedule. We like our routine of waking up at the same time, getting ready in mostly the same way, going to the same place, seeing the same people week after week. We rely on these rituals to give our lives order and structure. It gives us the illusion of control that we need. We need that illusion to stay sane. We are not going to fit all of the little pieces of church into this new format. And I can't tell you how things are going to turn out or how long we're going to have to have worship online or even what format we'll decide is the best for online worship. It is a giant jigsaw and we all have to stay sane while figuring this out. Church consultant Dan Hotchkiss has said that the phrase organized religion is an oxymoron. The task of any church is to provide structure and the comfort of tradition. However, the other task of church is to cause us to grow, to learn, and to change our way of being in the world. There's a tension there between teaching and holding tradition and pushing out into something new. 
church holds and comforts us while also putting us in a space of discomfort. As Unitarian Universalists are so very fond of saying, this is a both and. Nothing could be more true of church in the year 2020. As I was leaving our campus on Thursday, I stopped to check the signage that we've posted to let everyone know that all BUC events and activities are canceled. As I stood looking at the door, I felt honestly very sad. Our doors now have two signs. One that says that no guns are allowed on our campus, and the other says that everything is canceled until further notice. And all I could think was that this is not the church experience that I had growing up, and it is not the church experience that I had imagined for my future. And as I stood there letting these thoughts and these feelings sink in and wash over me, I moved from a space of grief to one of peace. This isn't what any of us had expected or hoped to deal with. And yet here we are. There is no sense in pushing back against things that we can't control. There is peace and accepting that this is our current situation. It's just what it is. In this situation, just like every other situation, and every challenge and every struggle and every fear and frankly, everything that's good is temporary. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing can. Everything changes, including this. We cannot control what happens in life, but we can control how we react. After I processed through this reminder of an ultimate truth, I felt a real sense of pride. BUC has done the right thing. We have to protect our congregants as best we can. We have refused to be lost in denial or to succumb to fear. We have reacted quickly and we have made smart choices knowing that there will be some challenges ahead. This could be very hard on our finances. This could be very hard on our programming and this will definitely be hard on the social interactions that we've all come to rely on. Knowing full well about those concerns, we did the right thing anyway. We adapted and we cared for each other in a tough situation. And I'm proud of that. All of us have had experiences in our lives that have taught us to grow, to change, adapt, and cope with ambiguity. We can draw on that now. Our individual experiences will improve the collective experience. And honestly, that is kind of the basis of our religious tradition. Ambiguity, adaptation, change, growth. That's what we're here for. Nothing about Unitarian Universalism is set out for us. We have a few principles to navigate by, but it is up to us to find our own path. And as a church, we're finding our path. We're finding our path to online worship, to online fellowship. This is going to be a journey for us all. Some of our, I, here's, Worship associate, Linus Beale, everybody. <laughs> Excuse me. This is going to be a journey for us all. And I promise you that some of our ideas will not work out. But a lot of them will. And I ask for your patience and your support on this journey. So I ask you also to take care of yourselves to take care of each other, 
to remind one another that you are not alone, that you are valued, and we are still connected, even if we are apart. Beloved, there is so much good in this world. And we, we are a part of that good. And we are worth fighting for. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. So we'll move now into the questions with the minister portion of today's service. Uh, it is it is not typical to watch so many of you talk during a service. <laughs> so that's that's been interesting too. So I you know can only do so many things at once. Uh, and I don't know if you've been asking questions or just talking to each other. Um, so let's, uh, let's start over if you ask those questions. Uh, so this is an opportunity to ask any burning theological questions that you might have. We're going to put the chalice back in here for a second as a reminder that today we are still in the space of worship. So we're not going to get into technical and administrative questions. So let's stick to theology Unitarian Universalist history, the meaning of life, questions for me personally about um, my beliefs or, I mean, it's not that exciting, but if you have them, I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, we will end at 1130 at our regular time. Uh, so if you would please, if you have suggestions, you can go ahead and submit those now. <laughs> Julia Pulver says that the extroverts need to connect with our people. You know what? That's not a question, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it, Julia, and anybody else who's been thinking about that. Uh, so Sarah Constantakis, our amazing uh, media and communications coordinator, and I have been talking about the best format to do like check-in groups, chat groups, small group type um, events. So we have some ideas. If, if you have other ideas, if your name is Andrea Zellner, for example, and you know a lot about, um, you know, how to do these things, we'd love your ideas and advice. We're also thinking about the right platform. So please shoot an email to uh, Sarah and myself and we'll, we'll do the best we can to provide times throughout the week for people to socialize. Uh, Andrea Zellner, you're right. It is hard to do this without people nodding or frowning. I have no idea how you feel about what I've said, <laughs> except for um, it seems like Linus got a big reaction. <laughs> but other than that, um, I guess I'll just assume that everybody's okay. All right, so Natalie says, would love to hear your thoughts about talking to our kids about COVID via the lens of our principles. Good thoughts, Natalie. Um, well, I would start off that, you know, the first, um, you know, best practice that I have is that uh, you only answer the questions that are asked. It is hard for adults not to overload children with information. Uh, so try your best to just answer the questions that they ask. But in light of our principles, what we wanna do is um, remind them that everybody has worth and dignity, and that's why we've had to change a lot of how we're handling things, because we wanna protect other people. Uh, even if we feel fine, there might be people who have uh, problems with their immune system. We want to take care of them. Um, and I would also kind of go to the seventh principle too. Uh, you know, that one is typically used for ecological purposes, but I think it's important to remember that it also applies to our relationships. So even if we're separated from our friends or our families or the places that we love, we're still always connected to them in our hearts and in our souls. Uh, and then back that up with, with trying to find opportunities to actually talk by phone or, or FaceTime or whatever you got. Uh, let me know if that didn't quite answer what you were looking for. Uh, Andrea, thank you. Yes, we will we'll definitely come up with something, but thank you for taking notes on your ideas. Always helpful. There, right, anybody else? Nobody wants to know why there's evil in a world that's created by a good and loving God. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> so Ed says, missing the usual Sunday morning gathering with birds and music and enjoying the safe space, but virtual worship is something. I don't know what the rest of you said. Oh. 
is right now a good alternative. So Ed, I think you missed the beginning of the service. Um, we are we are working on a format to provide the music and other aspects too. Um, we'll figure that out hopefully this week. All right, so Cindy says, Jane O'Neill has an idea to make the Sacred Earth Congregation Art Show into a virtual slideshow for all. That sounds dope. Yeah, everybody submit stuff to uh, to these two people. That sounds great. How are you liking doing this podcast? Well, you know, uh, it's it's new. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right, you know. Um, I cracked a joke last year about looking forward to not having to do things for the first time this year. Um, I should have known. <laughs> Uh, I think things will get better over time. Uh, so Anna says, advice for those of us who live alone. Great question, Anna. So uh, we did set up a link um, that was sent in the original announcement that we are going to be closed. For everyone who would like check-in phone calls um, for the you know, purpose of isolation and also how's your health, uh, to uh, you know, sign up and then we'll have people call you. Uh, you can select if you want to be called weekly, bi-weekly, or every other week. So I would encourage you to do that, Amy Smalley is putting together a phone tree of volunteers that will then make those phone calls. And we will be offering opportunities for online gatherings as well. Good question, Annis. Uh, Jane says, tell folks how to turn the comments on. You know, Jane, that's a great idea if I knew how to do it. I would uh, certainly tell people how to do it, but this is my uh, my second time using Facebook Live. Some of you saw my uh, big venture yesterday to, uh, to do it for the first time. <laughs> Andrea Zellner or somebody, <laughs> tell people how to turn on your comments. All right, so Julia Pulver says, any questions, any suggestions on how to take our UU values out into our isolated world right now? Oh, that's a great question too. Well, I would say that we should be doing our best to um, push back against uh, an administration that has um, absolutely bungled this and some of that intentionally. So I would say letter writing, emails, uh, et cetera, are a great idea. And then again, taking care of each other, finding ways, you know, sign up to be a person who makes those phone calls and uh, take care of each other during that time. All right, Kathy Duhame says, though I know this format is free, have you considered using a meeting app such as, I think you mean Zoom? And yes, yes, we have. Um, we have indeed. So yeah, we're, we're researching that kind of stuff. Um, Upper right hand corner tap use a little bit. good. So Zoom is being used right now. Uh, the church's Zoom account is being used right now by our sixth through eighth graders. Uh, so we need to figure out how to do religious education and worship, considering that we've got um, six through eighth graders, which needs to be six and seven plus eight for rope, and then nine through twelve. So we need to figure that out so they can interact with each other and uh, and then also worship. So. I feel you. We'll get there. Um, so, Jeff, I don't think I know you, Jeff, um, but I'm glad you're on here. Maybe you can do a Facebook pay so people can make donations. Yeah, that's definitely been on our mind, too, is how do we handle um, the regular offering time? You know, this just came at us really fast. So that, that's a good suggestion. Um, Jane O'Neill, there's a box. Okay, good. So Jane's explaining how to do that. Uh, so is Andrea. Perfect. Google Meet right now? Yes, Tom, that's the thing that we looked at um, is Google Meet. I know that they've increased their uh, bandwidth ability. So uh, that's that's on the list of things. Uh, Sarah is also telling you how to turn on the comments. All right, guys, so I think we're getting into administrative technical territory, and I'd like to pull us back a little bit. You know, this is a worship service. Um, Chalice is still lit. It might be hard to see. But let's kind of get back into a, a space of, of worship. I'm glad to see that everybody's interested in talking to each other. Um, that's good. Keeping up that sense of community. It's okay, guys. <laughs> Everybody doesn't have to say oops. You know, it's easier to be in a a headspace, a technical space, than it is to um, be in a hard space, especially during a time where things feel scary. It's it's a natural thing for that emotional system to be overwhelmed and to go straight to the head. Uh, what creative things we are doing to keep ourselves busy and happy? Well, I wrote, I wrote this worship service. <laughs> Um, so that helped. Uh, so Abha says, how are you and Jesse staying sane and safe? 
well, we're not going anywhere. So that's, that's how we're staying safe. We also have been, you know, it's just the two of us, we're still occasionally Lysoling stuff. Yesterday was our anniversary. So uh, we did a lot of pay-per-view and ate some, uh, you know, rich foods. Um, so that's, that's how we're staying sane so far. Um, beyond that, uh, I got a new adult coloring book because I don't like doing art, and I'm trying to push myself out a little bit. All right, Natalie says, you will need to read what they write about turning on... Yeah, you're right. I will. Uh, can we all talk about what we think about how our principles apply here? Yeah, we've done that some, and sure, we can get back into that a bit more. Uh, yes, I'm thinking that it might be I, to rebalance our lives. Good. Um, I agree. Practicing so how do we help our neighbors when we need to practice social distancing? That's a great question. Uh, you can drop food off on people's porches. You can also send letters to each other. Um, you can leave notes on each other's doors. You guys, I saw in Italy they had a party where somebody was you know playing music on their patio and people were dancing. Um, also, people were singing together. I think that's great. Um, good morning, everyone. So grateful for this podcast. Are there any readings you would suggest for this unusual time? Yes, definitely. So I have been posting those on my uh, Facebook page, my personal page, but I'll ask if we can, I will, I will ask Sarah to put them on our uh, BUC page for sure. There are a lot of things that are being published um, by various UU ministers right now that are specific to this. And yeah, we'll get those up. All right, and such a total catastrophe for the world. Ideas about how what is happening tells us more about the meaning of life. Well, the meaning of life is different for all of us, right? So first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that I just have my own perspective here and I don't represent a broader perspective of any religious tradition. Um, but for me, having something like this happen highlights the, the primacy of human relationships, and in my mind, there's no other reason for us to all be here than that we are meant to relate to one another. And the fact that we're not able to do so in the way that we are used to, I think, you know, tells us a lot about what is important to us and what that meaning might be. What, I've, what I'm seeing on here is the need to socialize and the need to care for each other. That's, that's what I've heard the most. And so I think when we're not able to do those things as much, it highlights the need, the need for them. Uh, all right, so Kelly says it's a little different for her because she's still working closely with patients. Yeah, let's hear it for our medical professionals. So that's somewhat scary, but it's... I can't hit the link to see more. I'm sorry, Kelly. I can't see the rest of yours. I think it's too low on my phone. Man, I wish I was born just a few years later sometimes. Oh, there we go. But it's your job. You know, Kelly, I actually would, would yes, yeah, it's your job. But I wonder if it's also maybe a calling for you, you know? And uh, that's a lot. I'm, I'm holding our medical professionals absolutely in, in my heart right now. Um, our society would, would crumble without you. Uh, so Tom says, wash your hands. Yes. Mary Oliver, yep, is always a good suggestion. Do I have a mantra? Yes, uh, that we can use when we feel like we just can't cope with the chaos anymore. Yes, um, most of the mantras I know are in Sanskrit. Um, I will do some looking up and find some English translations. There's one that's called the um, the stop handle that's good for stopping anxiety. It's like pulling the handle on a wagon. Um, so I'll look that up and then I'll get that up somewhere. Um, also everything's going to be fine is a decent mantra too. Don't forget breathing like we did earlier. Volcano breaths are good. <sighs> really good for releasing tension and, and good with little kids. All right. So Karen Steinke says, I am trying to view this isolated time as an opportunity, not a punishment to tackle some more of the creative projects, uh, that time doesn't always permit and to reach out to people that I haven't kept in contact with. That sounds like a great plan. I'm planning to just really get down and clean some of the stuff in our apartment that's been neglected a bit. <laughs> For sure. Uh, Karen says the connection is so important. Yes. Uh, again, we're going to try to get those chat rooms up hopefully this week. Uh, so Izzy says, what would be a good idea for folks to keep track of what they found to be a silver lining in this forced isolation? Uh, what, oh my God, why is it so hard for me to expand these comments? 
Oh, man. Uh, there it is. What inner resources they have found and we're not aware of, etc. You know, meditating on what's what's good, meditating on that silver lining, um, making lists, journaling, all of those things can be really um, powerful methods for keeping up with the, uh, the silver linings that you have found here. Uh, you might even make a gratitude jar. So every day, write down something that you're grateful for, put it in a jar at the end of the week, take all those things out or, you know, a couple days, take everything out and read those things that you were grateful for. All right, so Cheryl is replying to Sarah. Yeah, Eric's got a really good point here. Birds are singing, spring is happening, good stuff is going on. Uh, Abha is calling more, texting isn't just isn't cutting it. Yeah, we're so used to texting nowadays and we need to probably make some, some phone calls for sure. Um, <laughs> Brown makes the good point. This may have been a conspiracy by dogs considering that they can't get the virus. They may be behind it entirely so that we have to stay home and pet them. I don't mean to be insensitive. I know I know it's a real thing. But the dogs are happy that we're home and so are the cats. Uh, <laughs> Brianna doesn't have to make nut-free lunches. It's true. Focus on the positive. Um, mm -hmm. Realizing the importance of talking to people on the phone. Uh, oh, Karen says that the Living by Heart group is continuing online. That's great. Maybe you guys can, um, you know, extend an invitation to new people. Maybe send that to Sarah so we can get that out. I think uh, artistic expressions of the soul are really important right now. All right, Tom says, maybe she already answered it and I missed it because I was focused on my Google Meet comments. Oops. Okay, I think you're replying. Oh, you're replying to a different Tom. That's confusing. From now on, there's only one Tom at a time. Keith says video conferencing takes a bit to get used to, but it adds an additional dimension. Yep. You guys are really bad at Ask the Minister. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm glad that nobody had any really intense theological questions because it is early in the morning. But, <laughs> you know, how often do you get an opportunity to just... um you know, ask anything you want, any burning theological questions. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> All right. So Julia, we are going to reschedule Daffodil Sunday. We're not going to just skip it. Um, the daffodils are already popping up at BUC. So we'll make sure to get a lot of pictures of those. Uh, but yeah, we'll still have that and we'll reschedule the transgender day of visibility. And, and we're going to have to not do the Seder, but maybe we can do something at another time. Um, so, sorry. Abha, why are you so drawn to Lord of the Rings stuff? Oh, good question. So it's important to remember that, uh, as, as a person who identifies a, as a Christian, um, you know, C.S. Lewis and, um, J.R.R. Tolkien were very devoted Christians. And so those messages of redemption and sacrifice and salvation and the evils of, um, ambition, too much ambition, are very prevalent in both of their work, uh, both of their works. Um, also, there's a strong environmental message and a strong anti-war message in uh, Lord of the Rings. It was written after Tolkien's service in World War I um, that rendered him you know, very traumatized. And, uh, but yet there's always a, a seed of hope, always a seed of hope there. And I, I find that very appealing. Uh, what can we do to keep it Special. Oh, Daffodil Sunday? Well, it'll be the same, just uh, just later. Um, maybe we'll be able to buy some daffodils and put them around. Uh, Cindy says, well, then what about evil? <laughs> Do you want me to talk about evil? Is that what that question means? All right, Andrea says, you guys got to slow down. Uh, no burning theological questions right now, but maybe I will think of some. Uh, new segment, Stump the Minister. Well, all right. Uh, what did you anticipate we might ask? Yeah, I think... Um, I think our beloved community may have been a little bit bereft of theology. <laughs> so I, I imagine that, yeah, you know what? Maybe you were not prepared for the the format and the rubric. I, I can surely see that. Um, okay, Julia says, what would Harry Potter do? Uh, Harry Potter would isolate himself and take on all of the burden alone and, um, you know, practice uh, yeeting wands out of people's hands. But what he should do 
is a focus on building his community because that's where his strength always came from. Uh, Harry Potter was able to love because of his losses as opposed to, yeah, Harry Potter would whine and break the rules. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So going through loss and being able to still love is what made Harry special. Uh, so I think that that's something that we can draw from on this. We have lost each other in person. We have lost our routines. We have lost our comforts. Uh, and yet we can still move with love through that. Debbie Fordry, can you speak to the role and search of for having faith? Um, yeah, so humans, I believe, are uh, it's necessary for us to have faith in something. Now, that might be faith in each other. It might be faith in the seasons. It might be faith in gravity. But we all have something that we count on that gives us, um, it compels us, that gives us a sense of direction and purpose. So... What's hard for me in a time of unstructuredness is to not lose sight of that. And I can become kind of listless and, and grouchy and, you know, um, depressed a little bit, you know. So for me, um, continuing to move on that path is important, right? So my own spiritual practices are very important during times that are, that are less structured. I hope that's what you're looking for. If not, please ask something else. Heidi says, do you identify as a Christian, but with Jesus simply as an example, but not a savior? Well, it depends on what we mean by savior. You know, saved, saved from what is always the first question when we're talking about a savior. Uh, for me, uh, Jesus is a, a moral example. Uh, I believe that Jesus was human uh, exclusively. Uh, and for me, those stories have more power for someone who is just a normal guy, right? Because I'm just a normal person. And if Jesus can accomplish so much and love so much that it scared people enough to kill him well so can i right and i think that i think that has a lot of power amy smalley says and then use an experiment yes what would hermione do well hermione would hit the library and look up everything there is to know about coronavirus and uh, then tell everybody to wash their hands obnoxiously every 15 minutes and get herself all worked up <laughs> about it <laughs> These are funny. All right. Helen has replied to someone else to Abha. Do you think that evil falls upon us as a way of leading us to flourish uh, amid difficulties? You know, that's interesting. So um, Cindy asked about evil earlier as well. Um, so evil uh, is a loaded term. Evil is a loaded term. Uh, so influenced by Reinhold Niebuhr, I would say that for me personally, uh, that we have a way uh, that we want to be in the world. We want to be benevolent. We want to be um, generous. We want to be um, aware and, and engaged. And there's something in us that prevents us from being able to do that. Um, we are created or designed or we have evolved to want to do and be something that we're not. And for me, that compels us to continue trying. Uh, I've been reading a lot of Julian of Norwich. If you don't know who that is, I encourage you to look it up. But, um, you know, so Julian of Norwich was, a, was an anchoress. She was a mystic. And um, she had visions of Jesus and of God. She was, you know, Catholic. It's like the 14th century, right? Uh, and I was, I was reading some of her, uh, visions the other day and she was asking, she was, you know, feeling really terrible for having sin and, uh, just abject. And, uh, the response that she got in her vision from God was that, uh, sin is necessary. Sin is necessary because it allows us to grow and to receive grace. So that's something I've been working with. Interesting. Um, and Braid says, you've mentioned wanting to explore your visual creativity some example of a, an adult coloring book. Do you see that as strengthening your relationship with the creator? Um, maybe. I see it as focusing my mind and cutting down on my anxiety. Um, I do have a daily prayer practice. Um, I have less of a relationship with God as a creator than God as a sustainer. Um, but maybe. Tapping into creativity in the creator, I see that. Um, I have a fear of creativity. <laughs> Oh, well, visual arts creativity, uh, because I always felt like a failure at it. And it's hard for me to do things I don't feel like I'm good at. All right. Mary Jo says, for me, the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter have themes of those who might otherwise 
be seen as the leaders in the battle, whatever that might be, recognizing that someone smaller, younger, slighter is key to success. Yeah. And rallying all resources around that. I see parallels in many real life situations. You're right. You're hundred percent right. Uh, in Christian liberation theology, we'd call this a preferential option for the poor, meaning the ones who are left out are the site of additional um, love and attention from God. So yes, I love that too. All right, Andrea Zellner. Yeah, good. Um, yes, do you have any suggestions on what to say to people who make comments that are xenophobic? <sighs> it's exhausting, right? Well, you know, the, um, the snappy, somewhat sarcastic part of me would remind them that Europeans wiped out almost the entirety of the population of this continent with, with germs. <laughs> that, <coughs> excuse me, that um, Europeans brought untold damage everywhere they went because of the germs that they carried. Um, and, and that this is not a problem because this um, developed or began in China. This is a problem because, uh, you know, this is the world we live in where we're so connected and we take that for granted sometime. And that also our federal government disabled its ability to respond to these types of crises. That's what I would say. Um, Andrew Zellner, a spiritual life and perfection is one of my favorite books. It was related to what Mandy just related about. So cool. Uh, what's that book though? Neb Durek, The Current Pandemic Versus Biblical Plagues. Thoughts? Um, yeah, so most biblical plagues are actually you know, kind of hinted at or, um, yeah, they're, they're the subtext. They're, they're the subtext for a lot of the, um, especially the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, interestingly, uh, leprosy, as we think of it, is not a thing that existed at that time and place. There were a variety of skin disorders that, as the Bible was was translated, there was like a universal, like an umbrella term. that, And so as the Bible was translated, it was called leprosy. And it also was probably a metaphor um, for people who were outcasts for whatever reason, because there's always, there's always been outcasts. Um, so I would say that it has always been the case that the most vulnerable among us have been the first to, uh, to suffer from, from plagues. And that it is the role of others who are less vulnerable to care for them and to uh, to not only care for them on a physical level, but to care for them on an emotional, spiritual level and to stand up for them uh, with the, the political powers that be. Um, okay. Any quotes from the Chronicles of Narnia? You know, I actually haven't read the Chronicles of Narnia. I don't think I have. Uh, maybe I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when I was a youngin, but I I haven't gone back to reread that. I should put that on the list. I've been trying to work my way through a lot of fantasy. Right now I'm reading The Mists of Avalon. <laughs> so in a year, when I finish that, <laughs> then maybe I'll look at um, the Chronicles of Narnia as, as my next thing. I guess the reason I mentioned C.S. Lewis is because uh, he was the person who uh, converted Tolkien to Christianity. Um, or maybe I have that backwards. Maybe the other way around. But they were um, spiritual conversation partners, and that's that's why that came up. Uh, Stephen Deering, music preference during these times. What a great question, Steve, um, from our one of our musicians. You know, I'm kind of vacillating between some some Krishna Das, which I know is questionable for the the white Kirtan leader um, to exist, but I find it very comforting. And chanting in general is, is really comforting for me. Um, I've also been listening to a lot of shouty music. Ani DeFranco has been on my playlist quite a bit for the frustration, I guess, that I'm feeling and, uh, you know, the resistance of her music, um, her resistance to the, to the patriarchy and, you know, capitalism has been really appealing. And then also um, oldies, country oldies, country oldies have been on the playlist quite a bit too. And I don't know if it's just because that was the music of my childhood, but I feel like there's also a rebellious um, spirit there. And not, you got to be careful when you use the word rebellious when you're talking about country music, I know. But, um, you know, just the kind of like, you know, stick it to the man and we'll figure this out ourselves type sentimentality that I appreciate. We band together against the powers that oppress us, you know? So I appreciate that. Julia says, any powerful movie suggestions to keep us all inspired and going as we prepare for our lonely, stressed out week? Um, <laughs> I 
I've mostly been watching garbage <laughs> because it, you know, for me, TV watching is, um, is a numbing behavior more than a self-care behavior. And sometimes we all need to just turn our brain off. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we just watch, we're working our way through the Marvel movies right now. And, um, we just watched, um, the Doctor Strange movie was the most recent one that we watched. And um, I found it to be inspiring and hopeful because it's, you know, a person who moves from from petulance and arrogance into a space of service and love. And so when I'm feeling angry and frustrated, um, it, it's helpful for me to think about transmuting that into love and service. Uh, Wendy Courtville, did you know that I have a deep, no, you're applying to, to Stephen. I have a deep-seated, irrational hatred of James Taylor. <laughs> I thought you were trolling me. I apologize. I understand that he is talented, and it's okay for people to like him. I personally... No, thank you. Um, yep. Go see Emma. Oh, Drika. I'm not going anywhere to see anything anytime soon. <laughs> Maybe that's me being paranoid, but... Um, <laughs> all right friends we have just a few minutes left here on um stump the minister uh amy Mo no 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 cindy mcleod you asked about evil earlier i think we did actually touch upon that um you know the other thing reinhold niebuhr said about evil that i think is important is that it is historically a fact that we can't say that evil doesn't exist or that it's a figment of our imagination or that even that we are individually responsible for it, although I think maybe, but, um, you know, we can't look at the history of war and oppression, um, and, you know, slavery, which is a type of oppression. We can't look at that and say that evil is not real. Right. So I'll just, I'll just add that to the longer, potentially very rambling answer that I gave about evil earlier. All right. Last questions here on, Stomp the minister. I guess this turned into it. <laughs> this is fascinating, the tail end of this. <laughs> Oh, man. Thank you, Tanya. Are we being punished? <laughs> By what? <laughs> oh, wait, you don't mean in this chat. You mean like are humans being punished by living in a, in a world where there is evil? Is that what you mean? Julia, clarify yourself. <laughs> You, you mean I'm punishing you by doing this? Or are you talking about it in a, a grander theological sense? <laughs> okay, I'll just answer it. The answer for both is no. <laughs> the answer for, for both is no. Um, I, as a, you know, heartfelt universalist, um, do not believe in a God that punishes. Um, you say yes. You mean yes to both. <laughs> Julia, it's because you know that we're in a worship space and I can only say so many words here. Um, no, I do not believe in a God who punishes. I, uh, believe that, um, I believe that I, I believe a lot of different things, but no, no, I, yeah, I have to agree with Hosea Ballou that the, um, the experiences of disconnection and pain that we have after having done something sinful is punishment enough. All right, everybody. Punishment for a human... No, I don't think so. Maybe you need a private questions with the minister session. This sounds kind of serious. <laughs> we'll set up an online confession booth. It'll be great. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, it's 1130, so I'm going to go ahead and, and sign off. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for participating today. Um, in the words of Julian of Norwich, our benediction today is... All is well, and all will be well, and all will be well. Amen. Bye, everybody. <laughs>